Hey everybody, how's it going? I hope you're having a lovely day. So one of the things that I've talked about in this channel for a very long time is right to repair and the fact that you should be able to fix what you own. And this part of the conversation has shifted in recent years to the just concept that you should own what you own. And that many companies are doing many things to try and make it so that they still own what you bought and paid for. And we've been going over that with things like car subscriptions. I've talked about the fact that BMW is charging a monthly fee for certain things like heated seats. They double down on the car microtransactions. New Jersey actually introduced legislation to try to ban it, and some surveys have made it very, very clear that consumers are just saying, you know what, I'm, I'm done with this. And I'd like to discuss this article that came out from Car and Driver over here that is, it's, it's old, but man, it just, it, it's still kind of, I'll be honest, it still kind of bothers me. It says, we found subscription menus in our BMW test car. Is that bad? We recently discovered a list of subscription-based features in a 2023 BMW X1 that we had in for testing, and we had some thoughts on it. And it's talking about ensuring that you are logged in. I don't want my car to ensure that I'm logged in. I just don't. I don't. I don't. Uh, some automakers have been toying with the idea of shifting the buying process. Rather than buying the features and packages you want when buying your new car, the automaker would grant access to the features on a subscription program. Instead of spending thousands on a cold weather package, you could pay for things like heated seats only during the cold months you need them. Cue alarm bells. Indulging for a moment in the slippery slope logical fallacy, what's next? Could companies lock horsepower behind a subscription paywall? What about safety features? Could a company turn off some features the way some tech companies stop supporting old software? So what is the slippery slope fallacy? The slippery slope fallacy is something you say when you say, this thing could happen, therefore, since I'm afraid that it could happen or that something similar may have happened in the past, I am going to act as if that is what is happening right now. And using the word fallacy is a way to make you feel like you're irrational for thinking that. And I resent this article for using that language because this is not a fallacy. What if a company locked horsepower behind a subscription paywall? They already did. It's $1,200 a year. It's not a slippery slope fallacy. They're already doing it. And this is the problem when you have people that are open to, and again, I don't think that's his intention. I don't think it's the article writer's intention to gaslight you. The unfortunate reality of the situation is that that's what they're doing. They're gaslighting you. In what area of your life have you seen a company give you more sovereignty, more freedom, more control, more ability to fix what it is you own as time goes on? What companies have decided, you know what, instead of a cloud subscription model, we're just going to revert to a model where you pay once and you own it and you have a perpetual license. Like, how often does that happen? Do you see Electronic Arts, Adobe, Apple, Microsoft, anybody doing that? No. They usually typically tend to move in the opposite direction. That has been the trend. That has been observable. That is objectively true. You are not on the slope of a slippery slope fallacy. It is reality. And to think of it as anything other than reality is being deceptive and manipulative. As Scott Galloway has said in his books and videos, there is something called the recurring revenue bundle, otherwise known as the rundle. Not only does a company make more money when they start selling something as a subscription service, but they also actually trade at a higher multiple. So instead of trading at five times revenue, you may trade at six or seven or nine times revenue, or well, let's be real in our ridiculous bubble environment now, much greater than that, based on the fact that your customers are constantly coming back to you. And that is why every single company is moving over to this type of model. And if you noticed it, you are not on the wrong end of a slippery slope fallacy. You are observing reality for what it is and you are not crazy. And somebody needs to reiterate that and remind you of it so you don't feel like you're going crazy when you read these types of articles. We were recently playing with the menus of a 2023 BMW X1 when we came across a group of screens offering exactly that short of subscription. BMW Teleservice and remote software upgrade showed us a message that read activated, while BMW Drive Recorder had options to subscribe for one month, one year, three years, or unlimited. Now think about it. What, what, what is that? You're using the camera in the car to record your drive so that if you crash into somebody, you can see it. You paid for the camera in the car. You paid for the recording device. But you can't use it until you pay again. And it's not just we want you to pay once. We want you to pay every single month for the thing that we already sold you. 
Slippery slope my ass. The reactions from car and driver were swift and emotional. One staff member responded to the menus with a vomiting emoji, while another likened the concept to a video game battle pass. We reached out to BMW to ask about the menus we found and to learn more about its plan for future subscriptions. The company replied that it doesn't post a comprehensive list of prices online because of variability in what each car can receive. Upgraded availability depends on factors such as model year, equipment level, and software version. So this keeps things more digestible for consumers, explained one BMW representative. RX1, for example, has an optional $25 per year charge for traffic camera alerts, but that option isn't available to cars without BMW Live Cockpit. Instead of listing all the available options online, owners can see which subscriptions are available for their car, either in the menus of the vehicle itself or from a companion application. BMW USA may not want to confuse its consumers by listing all its options in one place, but BMW Australia has no such reservations. In the land down under, heated front seats and a heated steering wheel are available in a month-to-month -month format, as is BMW's parking assist technology. In contrast, BMW USA released a statement in July saying that if a U.S. market vehicle is ordered with heated seats from the factory, that option will remain functional throughout the life of the vehicle. For now. For now. The jury is still out on the merits of its technology-based subscriptions in cars. Certainly, allowing customers the freedom to purchase the things they want and need instead of forcing them to buy entire packages is not a bad thing. But are endless subscriptions really the best solution for customers? In 2019, BMW announced it would charge customers $80 a year for wireless Apple CarPlay. After considerable public backlash, BMW walked back the decision and instead offered the technology for free. BMW is wading into mostly uncharted waters here. The court of public opinion forced BMW to reverse a subscription in the past. If people decide these newer subscriptions are as egregious as the old ones, will they force BMW back again, or will they instead stick to automakers who sell the features outright? And again, this idea that they're looking out for your best interest. You don't need to buy the heated seats if you only need them three months a year. We're looking out for your best interest. We don't want you to pay more money. Except here's the thing. Here's the thing. They're billing it to you as if they're bringing the price down. But that's not true. What they're doing is they're keeping the price of the product the same. They're bringing their own costs down by including this in everything. And then they're charging you more money to get what you would have already paid for. Not only are they charging more, but they're charging more every single month. This is not about bringing your costs down. You only have to pay for the month or two out of year that you need it. This is about the manufacturer keeping their costs down and not passing any of it on to you. Which is fine as long as we're being honest about what's going on here and not calling it a slippery slope fallacy when that is exactly what is already going on. Now, there are many people in the comments saying, well, if this is something where the car needs to connect to their servers, then I understand it being a monthly fee. Which, by the way, if you're using the car's internal dash cam, you're not connecting to their servers for that. At least I hope to God that you're not connecting to their servers for that. But in, in our world where privacy is a meme, I, you know. If you're connecting to their servers to do something like turn on your air conditioning remotely or something like that before you get in the car from very, very far away, there is some level of understanding I have for paying a monthly fee to maintain those servers and everything else. The problem that I have is this. With lots of different software, you're typically able to do something called self-host or self-manage. So in case my boss is watching, he loses it when he hears me say self-host. You're typically able to self-manage it. You don't have to use their instance. So for instance, if I want to use free PBX on somebody else's servers, I can do that. I can pay Sangoma and they can do all this stuff for me. Or I can take their software, I can download it, and I can put it on a server that sits in my closet. So my phone system runs in my closet. I'm allowed to host that wherever I want. Why can't I tell the car air conditioning computer to connect to a server that I run in my closet rather than the manufacturers? So I think, I know, I know this is a radical idea, but we used to be able to run software on our own computer, or we could tell our client to connect to our server rather than somebody else's. I can tell my web browser to connect to my server rather than yours. I can tell the phones at my store to connect to my PBX rather than connecting to Sangoma's servers. I know this is a radical idea, but what if, what if the computer in our car, not the driving part, not the part that sets the PID loop and acceleration, but the part that tells us, yes, you're allowed to turn on the air conditioner. You're allowed to use the dash cam. What if, what if, we had the freedom to actually self-manage our own instance of that software and use it the way that we saw fit. What if the computer in our car were treated the same way as the computers in the rest of our life used to be treated 10, 20 years ago? Radical idea, but what if my car spoke to my server that I hosted myself rather than pay you 10 or $20 a month? So that if I wanted to turn the air conditioner on, I have an application on my phone, I send a notification to my server, 
my car is connected to my server, not General Motors, not Toyota, not GM, not BMW, and told it to turn the air conditioner on. I know, here I'm being way too radical, right? In all seriousness, that's one of the things I appreciate about the company that I work for now, Futo. We have five principles to the software that is created here. And one of them is that you should be able to self-manage or self-host your own instance of any software that we create. Anything we create should be open source. If we are offering something that is a service in some way, you should be able to download your own instance of that software so you can run your own server and your client can connect to that server rather than having to connect to ours. The software should not see the user as a product, and the software shouldn't suck. Self-managing and self-hosting your own instances. This used to be normal. This used to be something that we were able to do. And now that just seems like it's just, that's, that's a bridge too far, Lewis. And again, I'm not talking about the PID loop here. I'm not talking about being able to set the acceleration on your device. I'm not talking about being able to put a typo into your integral gain. So instead of being 29, you set it to 2900 and the chain whips itself off your bike, cuts your leg and makes a hole in your wall. Guess how I know that? That's a typo I'm not making again. But in all seriousness, for the basic stuff, turn on the air conditioner. I know maybe somebody will get hacked. Maybe somebody will get hacked and their air conditioning will be turned on remotely without their permission. <gasps> Freedom, I know. Could just be the end of the world. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Am I being insane here or is a world where the computer in your car is owned by the manufacturer, configurable by the manufacturer, is only allowed to connect to the manufacturer and everything is a subscription from now until the end of time? Just not a world that you're looking forward to. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Thank you very much. And as always, I hope you learned something. And if this is something that is of interest to you, you should check out the fellowship program that we have at this organization that I work at now, where we are open to funding people to come here to Austin to create software as long as it follows the principles that I said above. Check out down below, futo.org slash fellows. And I've got a couple of interviews on my channel with the founder that I'll link to down below for anybody who is interested in that and, you know, wants to hear from somebody that's maybe even crazier than me when it comes to actually being able to say you own what you bought and paid for. See you in the next one. Bye now.